All right, good afternoon. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Dr. Katie Martin. I am a member of the Mini-PCR Bio team, and it is my pleasure to be sharing our Genes in Space Food Safety Lab with you today. Um, this lab will, is, uh, this webinar, I should say, is part of our regular Monday afternoon series of webinars uh, that we kicked off in response to the pandemic. So the basic idea of these webinars is um, that, you know, we know you're stuck at home. Many of us are stuck at home as well, and we can't get into the lab. Um, and so our effort here is to kind of bring the lab to you virtually, if not in reality. I am joined today by some of my colleagues from Mini-PCR Bio who are in the live chat. Um, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask in the chat box and they will answer your questions. Um, if you've attended any of our previous webinars, you might have seen our PTC Taster Lab presentation. Teachers, if you're watching, um, this lab that you'll see today is similar to the PTC Taster Lab in the technical richness that it offers, but I think you'll find this lab is maybe a bit more accessible, maybe a bit more approachable for your students. I'm really excited to be sharing it with you today, um, so let's get started. All right, so um, this lab at its core is about the tools we have to answer the questions that come up in an outbreak of disease. Um, we're really well familiar right now with the types of questions that arise during an outbreak, and we're asking them you know, of each other, of ourselves right now about the coronavirus pandemic. Um, these are questions like, where did this disease come from? How did it spread? How did it get to my community from its perhaps distant origin? Um, and most importantly, do I have it? Am I infected with this illness? And, you know, there are many different ways that we can catch diseases. Coronavirus, of course, is a respiratory disease that's passed directly from person to person. But then we think about something like malaria. That's a parasitic disease that's passed uh, by mosquitoes. And then you think of um, what we're going to be talking about today, foodborne illness, which is transmitted by contaminated food. Regardless of what way you catch an infectious disease, it turns out the tools that we have to answer these questions are the same across the board. And they're the same tools that I'm going to be demonstrating for you today. So I'm talking about um, PCR machine. So I have my mini PCR here that we're going to be using in this lab today. Um, we're going to be doing using the mini PCR machine and an electrophoresis system. I'm going to be doing some pipetting live. So this is meant to be a demo, but before I launch into the hands-on part, I want to share a few slides to kind of set up the lab exercise that we're going to be doing today. So when we talk about foodborne illness, we are referring to illnesses that you catch by eating food that's been contaminated with and is harboring pathogenic microbes. When I say microbes, I'm referring to bacteria, I'm referring to parasites, little microscopic things that we can't see with our naked eyes. Um, many, uh, back, many foodborne illnesses um, have a significant public health impact. So in an ordinary year, when we're not you know, dominated by coronavirus, foodborne illness is a primary focus for public health officials. And we kind of have a sense of that maybe when we see the headlines um, that roll in over the course of a year. So things like you know, the flowers being recalled because there's E. coli in it, or, oh, you should avoid your favorite Mexican restaurant for a while because they found listeria in the lettuce. Um, we see these headlines roll in over the course of an ordinary year Year, but they perhaps don't give a sense of the scale um, of impact that foodborne illness has on our population. In the United States each year, 48 million people are sickened by foodborne illnesses. Of those, 128,000 have severe enough cases where they need to be hospitalized. Um, and of those, 3,000 people die each year of foodborne illness. Um, these are big numbers. Some of them don't quite rival coronavirus at the moment, but in an ordinary year, I mean, the scale of this is up there with influenza, which is, of course, another major public health focus. Now, fortunately, we have tools to combat foodborne illness, and we're familiar with them because they're the rules that we follow when we prepare food in our own kitchens every day. So we do things like, you know, wash our hands before we prepare food. And sorry if you can hear that, there's a fire engine going by. Um, <laughs> We clean our hands when we're preparing food, and that prevents any microbes that we might have on our hands. It physically sweeps them away. Um, if we use soap, that soap actually disrupts the cell membranes of bacteria, um, which kills them. Of course, we cook our food, and one of the primary reasons we cook our food is because we want to kill any microbes that might be growing on it. And we keep our food in the refrigerator when we're not working with it um, 
chilling food doesn't kill microbes, but it does slow down their growth. So it prevents the populations of microbes on your food from getting too big. Now, if we were just growing our own food in our gardens and then preparing them safely in our own kitchens using these methods um, and following these best practices, maybe foodborne illness wouldn't be the problem that it is at the scale that it is. But the reality of it is that we live in a really complicated world. Um, the supply chain that provides us with food is really complex and there's lots of stops in between, you know, the farms and fisheries where our food originates and our own kitchens and restaurants where we consume our food. Um, that food has to be transported. It has to be stored. It has to be processed. And any step along the way, there could be, you know, your food could be held at an inappropriate temperature that allows microbes to grow, or there could be cross-contamination from contaminated food sources that could lead to the spread of, um, of, of pathogens. So distribution centers, processing centers, they use tests. They test their food to make sure it's not harboring pathogens so that by the time it gets to your plate, um, we can be pretty confident that it's microbe free or at least pathogenic microbe free. The ways that we have to test um, food, traditionally, the main way that we've relied on is called culture and antigen staining. So through this method, um, you take a swab of a food sample that you're interested in testing, and then you streak it out in a Petri dish, and any bacteria that were on that food will grow in the Petri dish. And then you can use stains, use chemical stains, to label the antigens, um, which are like surface proteins that are expressed on the cell membranes of bacteria. And which antigens uh, a bacterium expresses will tell you a little bit about its identity. If you've done this before, which you might have cultured microbes in your own past, um, you might have a sense of the disadvantages of this method already. Namely, this is a slow and inefficient method. It can take days to grow colonies of bacteria that are large enough to see and to stain. And in the course of responding to an outbreak, we don't have days to spare. There are also some microbes that will not grow in culture at all. So depending on what you're looking for, this method might not even be available to you. Now, fortunately, we have better ways of testing for the presence of pathogens now. Um, the way, one way, there's just, uh, there are multiple ways that you can do this, but the way we're going to be focusing um, on today is called nucleic acid detection. And the basic idea of these tests is that we're not looking for the whole living microorganism itself. We are looking for the DNA that that organism um, contains. So we're taking advantage of the fact that every living thing has a genome and the sequence of that genome differs by species. So if we see a DNA sequence that's associated with a pathogenic bacteria, species of bacteria, we can be pretty confident that the food sample where we found that sequence is harboring those pathogenic bacteria and we can um, you know, dispose of it so it doesn't infect anyone. The advantages of using nucleic acid detection are many. Um, to name just a couple, this method is much more fast, uh, much faster and much more efficient than culture and antigen staining. Um, I'm going to be zipping through this activity in about an hour today, cooking show style. But if you were following the same protocol for this lab today um, in real time, it would take you about two hours to finish. So two hours, vast improvement over the days it would take to culture microbes and stain them. Um, this method also does not require you to culture anything, so it doesn't matter if what you're looking for will or will not grow in a petri dish. There's no culture step, so we just zip right to the detection piece. So we're going to be doing a nucleic acid detection test live today. I'm going to be using the mini PCR genes in space food safety lab to walk through this protocol. Um, you should get a pretty good idea of what this lab looks like from this presentation today. But if you want any additional details uh, or more information about this lab, the student guide and the instructor guide are available as free downloads on our website. Um, there's a link in the description here that will take you to our product page and you can download the student and instructor guides there for free. The gist of this lab is that we're, you know, we're, we're trying to trace down the source of a, a pathogenic microbe so we can limit the spread of a foodborne illness. We, have, we know one of these two foods is sickening our population. It's either the burgers or the sushi. And our task today will be to figure out which food source is infected so we can get rid of it and it won't sicken any further people. Specifically, we're going to be looking for the presence of a pathogenic strain of E. coli in our food samples. Um, so E. coli, I'm sure you've heard of E. coli before. You might never have seen these organisms before. They are, oops, they are bacteria 
they look something like this. So they have like a cylindrical body shape. They're small. They're, you know, one to two microns in length. Um, and you can't really see them here, but they have flagella, which are kind of like tentacles that allow them to move through wet environments. We're not just going to be looking for the presence of any old E. coli, though, because there are lots and lots of strains of E. coli, and most of them are harmless. Um, some actually are beneficial to us. They live in our guts and they help us digest our food. But there are some strains of E. coli that um, can cause harm to human health that are pretty nasty bugs. Um, we're specifically going to be looking for one strain of pathogenic E. coli that go by the name E. coli 0157H7. Um, this paper is a paper that uh, our, this lab today that we're doing is actually based on. Um, these researchers found a way to identify this nasty strain of E. coli um, based on the sequence of its gene for um, uh, the flagellin protein, which is found on the, the flagella, one of the tentacles of those E. coli. This gene is called Flick, and the sequence of Flick varies strain to strain. These folks published a paper um, uh, that shows a method they use to, de to detect E. coli 0157H7 by looking at its flick gene sequence. Um, what are the effects of catching this bug? Um, this is an enterohemorrhagic strain of E. coli, which means it can cause inflammation and bleeding in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, the symptoms that can cause are diarrhea, blood in the stool, really nasty things we want to avoid. So we're going to be looking for this strain of E. coli in our two food samples, and we are going to be tracking it down in basically a four-step protocol. We're going to begin today by preparing our samples. We're going to prepare them to uh, run PCR, which is the method we're going to use to amplify our bacterial gene of interest. In our case, that is that flick gene that is going to differ depending on whether the um, strain is pathogenic or non-pathogenic. We're then going to take our PCR samples and use um, a restriction enzyme to digest them. That step is going to allow us to actually discriminate our two strains, um, our strains of bacteria. And then finally, we're going to visualize our results with gel electrophoresis. Um, if you were doing this in one continuous block, as I said, that would take about two hours. Um, teachers, if you were doing this in your classroom, you could break this protocol up over two days. Uh, on day one, you'd prepare your samples and then run PCR. And then on day two, you would identify your strains um, with a restriction digest and then do gel electrophoresis to view your results. I'm gonna, about to prepare my samples live, but let's talk a little bit about what samples I'm preparing. So this slide should give you an idea of the experimental design for this lab. Um, when you receive this lab, you get four DNA samples that we send you. Two of them are controls. So one of them is a sample of DNA taken from a known strain of pathogenic E. coli. The other is um, a DNA sample from a known non-pathogenic strain of E. coli. So these are our controls. They're gonna tell us what it looks like when pathogenic versus non-pathogenic bacteria are in our samples. And then we'll have those run out alongside our unknowns, <coughs> excuse me, our sushi and our burger samples. And the basic idea here is we're gonna match whatever results we see for our unknown food samples to one or the other control. And that is how we're gonna trace back which one is contaminated. Now, for the sake of time today, I'm just going to be preparing our two unknown samples live. Um, and let's talk for a second. Oh, yeah, before I jump off this slide, I just want to clarify one thing. When you receive this lab, we are not sending you pathogenic microbes. We're not sending you contaminated food. What we're sending you is purified synthetic DNA samples. Um, so there's no particular, uh, you know, extra safety steps you need to take with this lab. Um, you're not going to be growing any bugs in your classroom. And so at the end of the day, when you're through with this, um, you can dispose of these reagents um, in the regular garbage. No extra special steps need to be taken um, as far as safety goes in the classroom. So what am I going to be preparing these samples for? PCR. Um, I'll explain PCR in more depth later on, but um, just to quickly explain what the purpose of doing it is, um, it is a way that we amplify a gene that we're interested in studying or make many, many copies of a gene sequence of interest. In our case, we're going to be doing PCR for the flick gene 
um, we're going to make many copies of that because that is the gene that's going to help us distinguish our pathogenic and non-pathogenic bacteria. This is a really commonly used molecular biology uh, technique. It's often a, an initial step toward doing something else, toward doing a DNA sequencing experiment, or in our case today, we're going to be visualizing our DNA with gel electrophoresis. Okay, what am I putting in my tubes? For PCR, let's start with our template DNA. Those are our DNA samples from our contaminated food, from our controls. We're going to add to those primers. Primers are kind of like the magic ingredient of PCR. They are, um, you can think of them as bookends. They mark the beginning and end of our gene of interest. And then we bring in an enzyme, DNA polymerase, that replicates all of the DNA in between those bookends. So that is how we replicate our one gene of interest. In order for DNA polymerase to do that work of replication, we need to give it uh, building blocks. So we also add to this tube DNTPs or nucleotides, um, the loose A's, T's, C's, and G's that the enzyme can use to build new DNA strands. And then of course, these are all biomolecules. Their natural environment is the inside of a cell. Um, we want our tube to feel as much like the inside of a cell as possible. So we are going to make all this happen inside a buffer, which is like a solution that helps us maintain the pH at a place where all these biomolecules are most comfortable. Now, um, when you do this lab, you don't have to add all five of these ingredients to your tube separately. We actually pre-mix the last fr uh, three for you in something called PCR Master Mix, which looks something like this. Um, it's like this green solution. The idea here is basically it's like the Betty Crocker cake mix using that instead of like mixing the flour, baking soda and sugar yourself. It just saves you a little bit of time and effort on your end. OK, so I'm going to get my samples prepped now. I actually started a couple tubes that already have master mix and primers in them. Those are the same in, in all of our samples. The only thing that's going to be different is our template DNA. And so I'm going to add that template DNA to our tubes now. I have, you know what, let me switch my view here so you can see a little bit better what I'm doing. I'm taking my sample DNA with my sushi sample in it, and I'm pipetting five microliters into my sushi PCR tube. We'll mix it, and I'm changing my tip so I don't contaminate things. A new tip. And then I'll add the burger sample to my second PCR tube. And I will say the nice thing about this lab, because we're using purified DNA, it makes this lab really robust. So because you don't have to do the DNA extraction piece yourself, that removes a source of error, a source of variability. And so that makes this lab um, you know, pretty robust. You get good, reliable results from this purified DNA. Okay, so these tubes are ready. They look a little bit green. My master mix is green. I'm gonna go ahead and put them in my PCR machine. So PCR, as I said, we're replicating DNA. We do that by changing the temperature of these tubes in a way that orchestrates the DNA replication process. And so a PCR machine is also known as a thermal cycler. It's just a machine that cycles temperature up and down, up and down for set amounts of time. I'm going to be using today my mini PCR machine, although this lab would work with any PCR machine you might have access to. I'll show you my mini PCR here. This is my webcam. That's my mini PCR machine. I'm going to open it up. And then I'm going to put my tubes right in these wells. And we'll snap the lid closed, make sure the knob is tight, and we are good to go. Um, the nice thing about the mini PCR machine is that you connect to it, control it with your own device. So I'm going to program my mini PCR now. Let's click over to our mini PCR app, which I've installed on my computer, and I'll show you what it looks like to, to set your PCR protocol. So I'm in my library. I'm adding a PCR protocol. Let's call it Food Safety Lab. And then um, we send you all the temperature parameters you need, you need. So it's just a matter of copying what's in the protocol into your own program. And as I do that here, I'll just share that this lab is pretty quick. Uh, this PCR protocol is pretty quick as PCR protocols go. Um, you can get it done in like 30 to 40 minutes. Um, our default is to go for 30 cycles, but you can actually reduce this if you're pressed for time to 25. 
uh, minute, uh, 25 cycles, and you'll still get good, robust results. Okay, so my PCR machine is starting up. We're going to check back in on it in just a minute. Um, but in the meantime, I kind of want to go back and talk a bit more about the context for this lab because I glossed over a really important detail, um, which is the setting. So, yes, we are solving an outbreak of foodborne illness among a population. That population happens to be a group of astronauts um, on a long duration mission to Mars. So that suddenly ups the stakes of this, right? There's no hospitals in space. There is not a huge medicine cabinet in space. Um, so the potential consequences of an outbreak of foodborne illness are worse, right, than they would otherwise be. Um, why did we choose to set this lab in space? Um, there has not been an outbreak of foodborne illness on a long duration mission to date, and knock on wood, there never will be. Um, so why this setting? Well, it turns out modern food safety standards actually have their root in the United States space program. So this all started in the 1950s and 60s in the middle of the space race. NASA was gearing up to send astronauts to space for longer and longer um, lengths of time, long enough where astronauts would actually have to eat in space in order to stay alive and do their missions. Um, and so Astro uh, NASA needed to ensure a safe food supply. Now, in the U.S. at that time, there actually was not one uniform standard that food producers had to adhere to to guarantee safe food. And so NASA needed to kind of come up with one of their own. There are lots of smart folks at NASA. There aren't many food scientists. So NASA turned to Pillsbury for help with this. Pillsbury had previously been successful in supplying non-crumbly foods to astronauts. And so NASA called upon them again. And um, together they were successful in helping astronauts eat in space for the first time. So in 1962, John Glenn became the first American to eat in space. Here is John Glenn. Here is his pouch. Um, his first meal in space was applesauce. I don't know if this is the famous applesauce, but this is him eating from a pouch that that applesauce would have come in. Um, the fruits of this partnership between NASA and Pillsbury are something that have stayed with us to this day. Um, as part of this project, Pillsbury came up with something called HACCP, or the Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points Framework. This is a um, system, a risk management system, that the food industry uses to this day to guarantee food safety. Um, th this is still a certification that folks use, and it's actually used internationally now. Um, so this was is a really enduring um, uh, uh, result of that partnership between NASA and Pillsbury. NASA itself, their primary focus today is on the International Space Station. This is where they currently send astronauts um, and have been doing so for the past 20 years. If you're not already familiar with the International Space Station or ISS, um, it is a continuously orbiting spacecraft. Uh, it has been up in the sky since the year 2000. Um, it has been con continuously staffed since the year 2000. So astronauts have been living on there continuously for 20 years. They rotate in and out. Um, NASA almost always has an astronaut on the ISS, as does Russia. Um, a total of 15 nations cooperate to staff and maintain the ISS. Um, there are astronauts up there regularly from Canada, from Japan, from the UK, just to name a few countries. And that makes the ISS truly an international work environment. These astronauts live together, they work together, and they eat together. The food scene has really improved since John Glenn's days. Um, astronauts now have like over 100 meal choices to choose from on a rotating basis. And shortly after they get resupply missions, they even get fresh food. Um, so they get things like sushi, they get space pizza, and these look like maybe space sliders or space breakfast sandwiches. Um, so the food scene is, uh, there's a lot to choose from, and this food is all safe thanks to the HACCP standards that NASA and Pillsbury worked on you know, decades ago. But microbial growth on the ISS is still an ongoing concern, an ongoing area of focus. Um, to give you a particularly gross illustration of the ubiquity of bacteria on the ISS, what you're seeing here, this is um, a condensation collection line on the Russian side of the station. And this brown blob here is like a giant colony of bacteria, a biofilm growing inside that condensation collection line. Um, so that's certainly gross. I wouldn't want to drink out of that um, that tubing, but not necessarily harmful. Those might may or may not be pathogenic microbes. Um, but folks have found evidence of, say, antibiotic resistant microbes growing on the ISS. So this is something that we want to monitor and make sure we're keeping astronauts safe from. It used to be that um, 
monitoring the microbial environment required astronauts to sample pathogens on station and then send them down to Earth for analysis in Earth laboratories. But increasingly, that's not the case. Um, molecular biology tools are becoming small enough and ubiquitous enough that you can actually put them on the ISS and the astronauts can monitor their own microbial environments. So that's what you're seeing here. This is astronaut Kate Rubens. This is a DNA sequencer, and she is using that sequencer to sequence the genomes of microbes that have been growing on the ISS. So, um, and it's worth noting also that another tool they use to support this work of microbial monitoring is actually the same mini PCR machine that we're using in our lab today. So this is a uh, I promise non-photoshopped image of the mini PCR floating in the cupola of the ISS, um, and it's used to support this microbial monitoring work as well as other projects. So um, after that aside, I now want to return to PCR and talk a little bit more about this process and how it is used, how we're using it in our lab today, um, and how it's used to um, support microbial monitoring on the ISS. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, PCR is a technique we use to replicate DNA. We're, we're zooming in on one gene of interest and making many copies of it with PCR. And we're doing that through repeated cycles of a three-step process. So each PCR cycle has these three steps. We start with denaturation. So at the beginning of a PCR cycle, we have double-stranded DNA. That's what you're seeing here. It has this classic spiral staircase shape to it. Um, in order to read and replicate our DNA, we need to be able to read the sequence of bases that make up the inside of that helix. So um, in the denaturation phase, we melt this double-stranded DNA into two single strands. So we do that by heating the sample almost to boiling, and at that temperature, the hydrogen bonds that hold the base pairs together, they melt apart, leaving us with two single strands of um, our DNA. The next phase of a PCR cycle is the annealing phase. Um, annealing is a cooler, it takes place at a cooler temperature. The idea is that we want to cool our samples just enough for our primers to come in and bind to our sequence of interest. So uh, our DNA primers are short DNA sequences complementary to the beginning and end of our gene sequence of interest. And at this temperature, they come in and they bind, marking the beginning and end. This leads us to the extension phase, the final phase of a PCR cycle. Um, this takes place at 72 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature at which our polymerase enzyme is most active. So TOC polymerase comes in, at, at, uh, finds the ends of our primers, and then it just adds on to the end of them, using the loose DNTPs or nucleotides to build those new strands of DNA. And so look, we began this cycle with one double-stranded copy of our gene of interest and we finished with two. Now the rest of the genome is still there. The rest of that E. coli genome that we don't care about is still in the tube, but we've replicated just the part that we're interested in, just the part that we're gonna be asking questions about. And we doubled it with one PCR cycle, and we'll just keep repeating that process to double the amount of our gene of interest until we've done it enough times where we have a billion copies of our gene of interest. So just to look at that another way, we started our last cycle with one copy of our gene, and we ended with two, and then we'll begin the next cycle with two, and end up with four, and then four can become eight, eight can become 16, and on and on. And if we do 30 cycles of PCR, we end up with one billion copies of our gene for every copy we began with. Um, that's how, so this is an exponential amplification process that leads us to have like, you know, gobs of DNA of interest at the end of our cycle. PCR has been around a while now. It's been around since the mid 80s, just like me. Um, the first generation PCR machine was no machine at all. It was actually just three water baths. And you set the temperature, you know, in your first water bath to your denaturation temperature, the second water bath to your annealing temperature, and then the third water bath to your extension temperature. And then you yourself were the PCR machine. You just dipped your samples in one bath after the other until you had done 30 cycles. The second generation machine really improved on this design by automating the temperature cycling process. Um, you could put your tubes in and then walk away and go do something else. And when you came back, your DNA had been amplified. This was a huge improvement, but it introduced some issues of its own. So this is a large machine. It's about the size of a microwave. Um, and it's also opaque, so it's not obvious 
how PCR works. It kind of obscures the underlying process. And those are two things we sought to improve upon with the development of the mini PCR. So mini PCR is obviously small enough to be able to fit, say, on the International Space Station. Um, it's also transparent. It's literally transparent. We also made the interface so that it makes the process of PCR transparent. So I'm going to click over to my app now so to show you what I mean by that. So this is the mini PCR app as I'm running my protocol. You can see our temperature fluctuations happening here in real time. These animations are showing what's happening to the DNA in each tube at each step. And then here you can see the number of DNA copies you've theoretically made over the course of your experiment. So the basic idea is to kind of render this process transparent, make it more obvious, especially to students and to folks who are just learning PCR, um, what the value of um, uh, what you're actually doing each step of the way. Okay, so to return to our experiment, um, once we're through with PCR, we are going to do a restriction digest on our amplified DNA samples, and this is the piece that's going to allow us to identify whether a tube contains pathogenic or non-pathogenic E. coli. So I want to take a minute to talk about a restriction digest and what it is. Um, when we are finished with our PCR, we are going to have um, ch many copies of our Flick gene of interest in our tubes. So for our controls, whether they're pathogenic or not, all E. coli express this Flick gene or have this Flick gene. And so in each of our control tubes, we should see this 400 base pair segment of our Flick gene that we've amplified with PCR. What will we see in our food samples? Well, um, we don't know for sure yet whether we're going to see pathogenic or non-pathogenic E. coli, but, you know, E. coli are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. We can bet there's some E. coli on our sushi and on our burgers, regardless of whether it's pathogenic or not. So we do expect to see that 400 base pair flick sequence in both of our um, food samples as well. So looking at this, you might wonder, what, um, what is the point of doing this? We can't really tell these things apart. How are we going to figure out um, which sample is containing pathogenic and which is containing non-pathogenic E. coli? That's where the restriction digests come in. So if you're not familiar with a restriction digest, um, it is when you incubate your DNA with something called a restriction enzyme, which you can think of as molecular scissors. A restriction enzyme recognizes a specific sequence of DNA and then cuts it the same way every time. Restriction enzymes are, um, were actually originally, they, they, they developed as part of the bacterial immune system. So bacteria express these enzymes and they, they're, they're weapons that they wield against viruses that might be trying to infect them. Um, they cut apart viral DNA. When scientists discovered this, they're like, oh, that'd be useful for my experiment. And so now we harvest restriction enzymes in massive quantities from bacteria for use in our own investigations, like our lab we're doing today. Restriction enzymes come in many, many flavors. Um, I'm going to walk you through one representative example just to give you an idea of how they work, but um, there are restriction enzymes that recognize all kinds of different DNA sequences and cut all kinds of different ways. One of the most common restriction enzymes is called ECO-R1. ECO-R1 is always looking for this uh, DNA sequence, G-A-A-T-T-C, and the sequence is a palindrome. So if you look at the bottom strand and read it five prime to three prime, it reads the same backwards, G-A-A-T-T-C. And ECO-R1 is always going to cut between the G's and the A's in a kind of staggered cut, a uh, sticky-ended cut that looks something like that. So just to illustrate how this looks in a real, real DNA sample, we have our, let's say we have one long DNA sequence. It does contain an ECO-R1 restriction site, GAA, TTC. If we add ECO-R1 to this DNA sample, it is going to cut that apart, and it's going to generate two restriction fragments. So restriction fragments are our DNA segments that we're left with after a restriction digest. And what we're going to be looking for in our lab today is what's called a restriction fragment length polymorphism. So we're going to be looking for a polymorphism or a difference in the lengths of the restriction fragments generated when we digest our non-pathogenic and our pathogenic E. coli uh, DNA samples with this restriction enzyme. And I'll tell you exactly what we're looking for. Um, we're going to be using this restriction enzyme called XMN1 for our digest today. 
XMN1 actually looks for, uh, it's a it cuts a little different than EcoR1, but it actually looks for the same sequence. It's looking for GAA, TTC, palindromic, same way on the bottom strand, but it's looking for that sequence to be interrupted by four nucleotides of any identity. So that's what this N means. N is not referring to this newly discovered fifth nucleotide. It is referring to the fact that any of the four uh, bases can appear there, G, A, T, or C, and XMN1 will cut the same uh, in, in any case. When XMN1 cuts, it cuts right through the middle of those four nucleotides, right straight across in a, a straight blunt-ended cut. Okay, so let's talk about what we're going to be looking for after we do this restriction digest. So first, focusing in on our non-pathogenic E. coli, we have our 400 base pair segment of our flick sequence that we have uh, amplified with PCR. Now, there are lots and lots of non-pathogenic strains of E. coli. Um, their flick sequences may differ slightly, so they have... Um, some mutations that have changed their exact sequence, but in no non-pathogenic strain, uh, strain of E. coli do we see an XMN1 restriction site. So when we incubate our non-pathogenic sample with XMN1, it is not going to be able to cut. We're not going to generate restriction fragments here. We're just going to be left with our 400 base pair length of flick. What about for our pathogenic E. coli? Well, in this strain of pathogenic E. coli, in this 0157H7 strain, there, uh, there's been a mutation that does introduce an XMN1 restriction site. It's right here. So we can see GAA, TTC, with four other nucleotides, uh, four other bases in the middle. Um, when we incubate our pathogenic E. coli with XMN1, it will cut and it will generate two restriction fragments. Um, we anticipate the lengths, based on where the, this restriction site sits, the lengths of those restriction fragments should be 250 and 150 base pairs. So this is the polymorphism we're talking about. Um, we'll see two fragments for the pathogenic E. coli, and we'll see just our one amplified flick gene for the non-pathogenic. Okay, so I'm going to set up my restriction digest now. So what I've already done is I've taken um, of my PCR samples that I've already amplified, I set aside uh, 15 microliters of those PCR reactions. And to those 15 microliters, I'm going to add just one microliter of my XMN1 um, restriction enzyme. And I'm going to switch so again, so you can see me a little bit better. So here's my restriction enzyme, my XMN1. I'm just going to add one microliter to each of my samples. And one microliter is a really, really small volume. I'm using the wrong pipette. Um, it's a really, really small volume. And it's really easy to lose one microliter in a tube with other stuff in it. And so honestly, teachers, this is a tip. Um, when we do this lab in our workshops, we actually dole out all of the restriction enzyme because it's really hard to um, keep those samples um, to do that one microliter pipetting when like the pipette's changing hands and there's kind of the general chaos of many groups doing this at once. And so our advice to you would be to, um, for you to be the one that kind of handles the restriction enzyme and doles it out to your students just to remove one potential source of error. Okay, so my restriction enzyme has been added and XMN1, oh yeah, let's switch back and show you my slides. XMN1 is a, um, was an enzyme that was isolated from bacteria and like many bacterial enzymes, it um, works best at a temperature higher than room temperature. And so we're gonna be doing this restriction digest at 37 degrees Celsius. So if you have a heat block, this is when you would pull that out. I'm actually gonna be using my mini PCR as a heat block today. So the mini PCR can cycle temperatures, but you can also tell it to just hold at one temperature continuously. And so I'll program mine to do that now. I've just loaded my tubes in my machine and I will switch back over to the app and we'll generate a new heat block protocol. I'm gonna call it 37 heat block. And we'll do that for 15 minutes. And then I'm going to save and run. 
All right, so the machine is starting up again. All right, so we'll return to that in just a few minutes. At the end of this digest, so we expect again to see two restriction fragments for our pathogenic E. coli sample, our control. We expect to see just the one flick amplified gene in our non-pathogenic control tube. The real question is what are we gonna see for our sushi and for our burgers? Um, one of these, we hope if we figured out which are the culprits uh, correctly, one of these should match the pathogenic E. coli sample. Um, that'll be the question that we're answering that we should be able to answer by the end of this webinar. Okay, once our restriction digest has completed, um, we are going to run gel electrophoresis to visualize our results. So the idea of agarose gel electrophoresis, if you're not already familiar with electrophoresis, um, the idea is that we're using, um, we are separating biomolecules based on their size using um, an electric current. So this, let's see, I'll show you. This is an agarose gel. It's called a gel because um, it's made of gel. It has this kind of floppy consistency like jello. And if you see these kind of holes along the top of our gel, those are wells. And we're going to be um, depositing our DNA into those wells. And then we're going to apply an electric current across this gel. And we'll put the positive pole of our electrode at the bottom. And that is going to draw our negatively charged DNA down through the gel toward that positive pole. Now, this gel looks um, super smooth on the outside, but if you look at it uh, on the inside with a microscope, you'll see it has this porous structure. It's like a kitchen sponge on the inside. And um, when the DNA is trying to travel down to the positive pole, different size fragments of DNA will have an easier or harder time getting through those pores. So we'll look at it. I have an animation that kind of illustrates this nicely. So let's imagine this... Um, this diagram is our gel, our DNA has been loaded over here, the positive pole of our electrode is down here, and then we have this large fragment of DNA, and then we have a small fragment of DNA, and when we turn on our electric current, we're going to pull that DNA down through, but small pieces of DNA are going to have a much easier time getting through and wiggling through those pores, whereas large pieces are going to get hung up and stuck kind of close to the well where they originated. So the end result of a gel electrophoresis run is you see, well, here's, here's what a run looks like. I've sped it up considerably in this animation. In real time, it, it takes a much longer time to get through. But at the end, you see something like this. You see these bands, and each band is one population of DNA fragments of the same size. We always run um, a gel with a ladder, usually in the far left lane in our case. Um, a ladder is like a heterogeneous sample of DNA fragments, uh, all of different lengths. And the smallest band we see on that ladder is going to correspond to the smallest DNA fragment in that ladder. For, for us today, we're using a ladder where the smallest band we should see, we know that DNA is 100 base pairs in length. And then we'll see a big bright band up near the well, and we'll know that uh, band contains DNA fragments 1,000 base pairs in length. And so then we'll, we'll compare our unknown bands, the, the bands in our unknown lanes, to that ladder to get an estimate of what their size is. Okay, so my I'm going to rush my restriction digest right now, and we'll see if that actually um, impacts my gel later on. I am going to load my gel now. So we'll do that live. So I'm going to be loading 10 microliters of each of my DNA samples into the wells of my gel. And I'll click over to my webcam now so you can watch me as I do this. Oh, shoot, let me put gloves on before I load this. So we'll start with DNA ladder. I'm going to load 10 microliters of that in the far left lane of my gel. And so can see here, this is my gel. I set it up earlier today and I um, poured buffer over it. So the buffer just kind of helps us transmit the electric charge through the electrophoresis chamber. And I'm loading my ladder in my far left lane here. And I think that worked all right. You see how the um, that well is now kind of darker than the rest. Um, my ladder has a purple loading dye in it, which makes it easy to see. 
And now I am switching my tips so I don't contaminate things. And I'm gonna put my sushi sample in the next lane to the right. 10 microliters again. And there we go. And you can see that, I don't know how well you can tell on this webcam, but um, our master mix that we ran PCR with has green loading dye in it. And so you don't need to add extra loading dye before electrophoresis. You should already be able to see your samples pretty well when you're loading them. I just now put my burger sample. I'm sorry, I did it. Yeah, my burger sample is in the third lane of my gel. Okay, now I'll put my cover on and I'm going to hit power and that will start running my gel. So we should, because we're using the blue gel today, we should actually be able to see our results before the end of the webinar if um, everything is working as planned. So we'll check back in on that in a few minutes, but actually before we even get to that, I want to give it a few minutes to run. And I also want to talk about um, a little bit about the machine I'm using today to do this. So using the blue gel electrophoresis system, it's a mini PCR product. Um, it looks different, certainly, than the electrophoresis system that I learned on. It is actually an electrophoresis chamber that sits over a blue light transilluminator. And if you make your gel with a green fluorescent DNA dye, um, that DNA dye will find your DNA as it's running through the gel. It'll bind to your DNA and you can visualize it when you turn on the transilluminator that sits underneath. And so this is nice. There's no overnight dyeing of gels required. Um, you can get your results in real time. So before the end of the class period or today, hopefully by the, well, before the end of our webinar. Um, to make things a little bit easier, you didn't get to see me cast the gel today or, or um, pour my agarose into the mold, but I used um, gel green electrophoresis uh, agarose tabs to do so. These are basically tablets that already have the right amount of agarose, the right amount of buffer, and the right amount of DNA stain uh, inside them. So you just have to dissolve them in water, uh, melt them down, and then pour your gel. Uh, one tab makes a 1-2% gel, which is the concentration of gel that we're using today. Um, so this just makes it even a little bit easier. So teachers, um, before we get into talking, unpacking the results, I wanted to share with you an opportunity um, to share this lab with your students if, if uh, using these methods in your classroom interests you. So of course this lab is available for purchase on the mini PCR website, as is this equipment, but we know for a lot of folks they may not have the resources to purchase a lot of equipment or even sometimes the lab kits. So we uh, founded the Lab in a Box Biotechnology Loan Program to give folks a chance to use this equipment and train their students in its use um, at, without having to make the financial investment to buy all this stuff. So Lab in a Box, uh, teachers who participate receive a free two-week loan of a class set of hardware. It arrives in a big case that looks something like this. That case contains four mini PCRs, four blue gel electrophoresis systems, and eight micropipettes, um, as well as other consumables and accessories. We also send you two um, food safety lab kits, so the same lab that we're doing today. Um, and two kits can accommodate up to 64 students. And then we also provide remote support. We have a really robust instructor guide. We have a robust training video, and we're always happy to offer live support as needed uh, because we know for some folks this is the first time you've used this equipment and some, in some cases the first time you've done PCR or electrophoresis. Um, this program is open to teachers in the U.S., who teach students in grades 7 through 12, and we are currently accepting applications for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, we can't accommodate every single loan request we get, so there is an application we ask you to fill out. Tell us a little bit about your goals. That application is open through this Friday, May 15th, so we encourage you to apply if you're interested in sharing these tools with your students. There is a link in the description for this video um, that'll take you right to the application page, um, and so do check that out before Friday if you're interested in receiving a loan of this equipment. 
Lab in a Box is actually an offshoot of our Genes in Space Science Outreach Initiative. Um, Genes in Space is an experimental design competition that Mini PCR Bio founded in partnership with Boeing. Um, we're also supported by our sponsors MFA, Math for America, um, Space Station Explorers, and New England Bio Labs. Uh, Genes in Space, in Genes in Space, we asked students in middle and high school to um, let us know what biology experiment they'd like to see done in space. So they basically design a biology experiment to be done on the International Space Station. And then each year we choose the best experiment and we launch it to the ISS where it's actually carried out by astronauts. Um, it's an amazing program. Uh, we just closed our 2020 contest over this weekend and we will be announcing our winners shortly. Um, this is going to be a really interesting year to follow the competition. We name five finalists, and then ordinarily we invite our five finalists to pitch their ideas to a panel of judges at a conference that takes place over the summer. But this year, no conf you know, there's no physical conference taking place, so our finals will be online, and they'll be open to the public. So anyone will be able to tune in and watch our finalists pitch their ideas. Um, I encourage you to join us. Uh, this will be a really unique year. You can get on our mailing list. There's a link in the description for this video. Um, get on our mailing list and we'll keep you apprised throughout the selection process and let you know how you can tune in. Okay, so our lab. Returning to our lab, is it the burgers? Is it the sushi? Let's find out. So I actually ran this lab this morning. Um, so even if our live results aren't quite ready yet, we can at least unpack the gel that I ran earlier today. So let's see what we saw. I'm going to reveal this to you kind of in stages. So this morning I ran my ladder again on the left side of the gel. I'm pointing out here the 500 base pair band and the 100 base pair band. All of the bands that we should see for this lab should be between those two marks. Now I did an extra step this morning when I, when I ran this gel and I actually set aside half of my PCR product and did not do a restriction digest on it. And I ran it out in my gel just to make sure everything is working properly. And so that's what these four lanes are. PCR only, no restriction digest. These lanes are our non-pathogenic and our pathogenic E. coli controls. And then these are our unknowns, our burgers and our sushi. And you can see in all lanes, I see a band at 400 base pairs, which is uh, that corresponds to our flick gene. That is our flick gene of interest. And it makes sense that we don't see any variation because we haven't done the restriction digest. But what this tells me is great, my PCR is working. That flick gene is there. I got a nice amplification result from, from each of my samples. The real um, question, though, is what are we going to see in the next four lanes, which is our lanes where we did do the restriction digest um, after PCR. So I'm showing you first my two controls, my non-pathogenic E. coli and my pathogenic E. coli. And look exactly like I said uh, would happen. Our pathogenic E. coli DNA sample was uh, digested by XMN1. We generated two restriction fragments. So that's why we see two bands here smaller than our 400 base pair amplicon. Those are our restriction fragments. Oh, and I should point out here, we also see these kind of faint bands at the bottom. Um, those are an artifact, a commonly seen artifact of PCR. It's called a primer dimer. It just happens when your primers kind of bind to each other. Um, general rule is if you see something this far below 100 base pair mark and you're not trying to amplify something in that region, you can ignore that primer dimer. Okay, our real question is what are we going to see for the next two lanes, our burger and our sushi lanes? I'm going to give you a chance to guess. I think it's always interesting to hear what people expect to be contaminated. So here's your chance in the chat box to um, share what your guess is as to what's contaminated. I've run this workshop with groups of teachers throughout the country. We offer this as a professional development workshop, and it's always interesting to hear um, what people's preconceived notions are about which, whether it's the sushi or the burgers. So I'm going to give you the same chance I give the teachers in person. Okay. Okay. Last chance to submit your guess. I'm going to reveal um, our results. Oh my god. So we have our burger lane. If we look through our burger lane, the pattern of banding we see exactly matches our pathogenic E. coli control, which means that it is our burger that's contaminated. Our sushi looks fine. No evidence of contamination there. So let's hang on to that sushi, but let's jettison that burger. Let's get it out of the ISS so it does not infect any more astronauts. Okay, that's our lab. Um, we have come to the dramatic conclusion of the food safety lab. Um, and teachers, uh, I, 
I hope that this webinar conveyed the thing I love about this lab, which is that you really get to familiarize your students with a huge repertoire of methods in a relatively short amount of time. So um, you get to take them through a complete molecular biology workflow in just two hours of contact time, either in one block or spread out over the course of a couple days. Um, again, like I said earlier, it's a really rich lab, but also a really robust lab. It's always interesting to, to see what, um, what else you can do with this lab in the classroom, how you can kind of flesh it out and turn it into more of a project. We have had a lot of teachers who have done this lab with their students as part of Lab in a Box. Um, one of them contributed an activity where um, he has his students issue a memo to NASA after the conclusion of the lab, making recommendations about what to do with the food on station. So he kind of adds on a persuasive writing exercise. Um, we also have a lot of teachers who use lab, the food safety lab. Oh, my restriction digest is done. Um, that's the chime on my mini PCR app. We also have a lot of teachers who use this lab in the run up to Genes in Space. So they have their students submit to Genes in Space as part of an experimental design exercise, a scientific method exercise. And they do this beforehand to kind of familiarize students with modern molecular biology tools. So. I want to answer a couple questions that came in um, from folks who registered for this webinar. Um, some folks submitted questions I believe I already answered, but for the ones who I haven't, we had a teacher ask if this lab can be leveled so a loan can be used for multiple grade levels. Um, for sure. So we have teachers use this lab again for students in grades 7 through 12. Um, folks in middle school, I think um, the the motor aspects of this lab can be kind of challenging, pipetting small volumes, working with really small tubes. So I think um, a lot of our middle school participants, they actually break this down to have students do just a subset of the hands-on methods. So if they have, you know, eight classes of eighth graders, they might have one class do the uh, PCR, one class do the restriction digest, and then the other class kind of receives it. They, they kind of hand it off between themselves and the final class does electrophoresis. Um, I've heard that's successful. We also have teachers who will like do the restriction digest part for their students, but have the students do PCR and electrophoresis themselves. So you can kind of adjust this so it's not like the full complement of methods and skills all coming at students at once. We also got questions about whether this technology can be used to fight COVID and what the difference is between PCR and qPCR. Short answer, yes. Um, you can if, imagine that instead of looking at E. coli DNA, we're looking for the COVID viral sequence, a signature sequence of the COVID virus. Um, same basic technique can be used. Um, we had a whole webinar about this last week, so I would direct you, if you want to learn more, to our uh, mini PCR YouTube page. Um, if you look, there's a recording of last week's webinar that is all about COVID-19 and how qPCR can be used to detect it. Um, someone else asked what the difference between PCR and qPCR is. Basically, in qPCR, you're doing PCR, but you've added a fluorescent dye to your tubes that binds to double-stranded DNA. So as you generate more copies of your gene of interest, you see more and more fluorescence as that dye binds to your samples. Um, that fluorescence can be detected in an automated way by a machine. And so that is typically how this is done in professional labs. Um, it's a lot less hands-on than what we're doing here. More of it is automated. Um, and Alex Danis, Dr. Alex Danis, who did this um, COVID-19 and qPCR webinar for us last week, she tells you much more about it. So if you're interested in any of that, I would direct you to that webinar. Final question, we, uh, someone asked how these tests are used by food safety regulators and by astronauts. Um, to answer the food safety regulator piece first, again, it's kind of similar to how we use these tools to fight COVID-19. The main difference is in the level of automation. So food safety tests have to be conducted on a massive scale. So we can't be manually like loading electrophoresis gels and stuff. So typically what food safety regulators use again is that qPCR method where amplification is detected in an automated way uh, by machines. Um, there are also other types of tests that are not nucleic acid detection tests. I don't know a ton about them, so I'm not going to delve into them here. Um, but I do know that, that PCR and specifically qPCR is kind of one of the gold standard techniques that is currently in use by food safety regulators. 
astronauts who are using PCR now to uh, monitor their microbial environments, they use PCR to amplify bacterial DNA, but often instead of just amplifying one gene of interest and um, running it out in a gel to look for, say, your flick sequence or a different gene, or not your flick sequence, your um, to, uh, to visualize that flick segment of DNA, um, they're not zooming in on just one gene. They're actually doing DNA sequencing where they take you know, the entire genome in their bacteria and they sequence it and that allows them to identify what species of bacteria contributed DNA to that sample. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of flavor about how this, these processes are adapted to the real world. In the last couple minutes we have, I wanna try to show you real-time results. Hopefully we got some good amplification and our digest worked. So I'm gonna switch over to my webcam Okay, so there is my blue gel. I've put this kind of imaging hood over it, this black hood. And then let's see, the black hood kind of blocks out ambient light. And then this is sideways, but you can just barely see results. My phone doesn't want to focus. But we see our ladder in the far left lane, which is on the bottom. We see our sushi sample, which I loaded into the second lane. And you can see our burger sample in the third lane. Oh, I lost it. And barely has run out enough, but you can just sort of see our larger, our larger DNA segments in the sushi lane, our smaller DNA segments in the burger lane, which seems to validate the results that we got with, um, that I got earlier today. So I think this experiment was a success, even though I really did rush that digest along. Okay, so um, in closing, I just want to share with you, we have a, a whole bunch of other learning labs from any PCR that use these same tools to solve other types of problems. If you want to learn more about the other ways these tools can be used, check out our labs. I would draw you, your attention specifically to the sickle cell diagnosis lab. Um, we're going to be giving a webinar on this lab, same time, same place, next week. This is a really cool lab where students, um, they genotype the members of a family for the sickle cell trait, and they connect that to phenotype. Our curriculum director, Bruce Bryan, is going to be walking you through that lab next week. Um, I encourage you to come back and check us out. All right. So with that, I want to thank you guys for joining me. It was great to see you all here. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to see you back here again, same time, same place next week for our next webinar. I'll see you later.